Hi, welcome to Get Used to It. I'm Sheila James Kuehl, your erstwhile host, and today we have a wonderful show for you. Um, you know, there's been a lot of talk over the past several decades about mental health in our community. Uh, much of it not terribly uh, positive, but all of that has changed or is changing, and I'm very pleased to have three guests today to talk to us about that history, about the present, and about the future of mental health in our community. Uh, first, Dr. Linda Garnetts, who's a lecturer in psychology at UCLA, who delivered the master lecture at the American Psychological Association Convention on Sexual Orientation as one aspect of diversity, and who is the co-editor of a 1993 publication, Psychological Perspectives on Lesbian and Gay Male Experiences, uh, which is a compilation of research about our community. Welcome, Linda. Thank you, Sheila. Glad you're here. Me too. Uh, we, next, Dr. Terry Gock, who is the Associate Director of Pacific Clinic's Asian Pacific Family Center and is the past chair of the Committee on Lesbian Gay Concerns of the American Psychological Association. Welcome, Terry. Thank you. And finally, as we say last but not least, <laughs> Dr. Jim Babel, who is a staff psychologist at the UCLA Student Psychological Services and who is also in private practice. Welcome, Jim. Thank you. Very glad you're all here today. Uh, this is a subject that I don't think has been much discussed out sort of on the public airwaves. Uh, we've heard a lot of uh, kind of uh, political psychobabble about our community, uh, most of it now turning kind of negative again. But I think we've made great strides in the past several years in our community and kind of interested in why. Linda, I know we were talking earlier about kind of the ancient history about our community. Um, mm -hmm. Wasn't very good to start with, huh? Not good news initially. But the reason that we have the pleasure of being here today is because that's really changed. Um, for so many years, the, the model that psychology used to really control us was an illness model. And uh, unfortunately, many people really felt the negative effects of that. Because in that model, the only healthy homosexual was a heterosexual one. Mm -hmm. I mean, there was no such thing as being healthy and being a gay or lesbian person. But it was sort of a step up from where we had been before, which was, you know, demons who, to be burned at the stake. This is true. But now, instead of being burned at the stake, you could have your uh, self shocked out of with aversive approaches to try to make people be straight. In other words, the methods that still were used, you may not be burned at the stake, but there was still very aversive and coercive and, and really uh, dangerous ways that people were using uh, to try to convert us from being homosexual to being heterosexual. You mean you'd be like taken away to a hospital and... You could be taken away to a hospital, you could be shown photographs um, that might be seen with two gay people uh, being romantic and then receive literally receive shock treatment to try to make you want to not have that association uh, things like that uh, many people were dragged by the parents or went themselves to get change because the mess the real the message was if you are a gay person you are sick the only cure is to try to become heterosexual and if you couldn't become that then you really were flawed and, and, some, and somehow inferior. And the message from the mental health professions, from psychology, was very powerful. I mean, uh, uh, I was talking to my sister the other day about the mm -hmm. fact that our parents' generation was not very psychological. They did what they did. They didn't think about motivation. It didn't occur to them that, you know, there was sort of cause and effect about behavior and how much that has completely gone 180 degrees so that in our generation we think of everything in terms of psychology, you know, kind of what causes this or why am I doing this? Probably too much, mm -hmm. uh, in, a, in a sense. Mm -hmm. And so the power, I mean, did, do you see that um, the, the power of the profession played a part in, the, in our definition out in the larger society? Absolutely. It played a part in how gay people themselves define themselves because at, for many years, until really until the 70s, most people didn't feel safe to be out. Literally, they could be thrown in jail or they could be you know, dragged to a hospital or to a, to a psychologist or a psychiatrist. So that for many people, it really, it, it, we, it, we, the psychology did define us. And it made people really think that they were sick, there were problems. I'll give you a classic example of my own experience. I was in graduate school, had just recently come out. And my professor brings in two gay men and two lesbians to come to the class. 
they come and tell a very personal stories about their lives. I'm already sitting there shaking just because, you know, we have, feel this connection. They leave the room and he takes person by person and points out to us their psychopathology and how it's tied to their gayness. So for me, clearly, it was a powerful message. This is sick. This is something to hide. And so for so many people, like myself, we hid and we were in an enormous pain. And, and were there studies then in, uh, uh, along about the same time that were used as weight to prove that we were sick? I mean, I well, you know, that's actually one of the pieces of good news because for many years there were studies that were trying to prove that homosexuality in and of itself was a mental illness. But those studies relied, they were very small samples and they relied on people in hospitals or in prisons and so on. It was one of these opportunities where actually research was on our side because beginning in the 50s um, with work such as Evelyn Hooker's and many others, there began to be research that began to study our community. And what was important is that it, it coincided with the homophile rights movement, which was a social movement in which lesbian and gay men began to talk to each other. It started right here in LA, Mattachine Society, Daughters of Belitis. So for the first time, there were samples of people who were not going to hospitals or, or, or going to psychiatrists. They were just regular folk who happened to be gay or lesbian. They studied these people, and study after study showed that we weren't any uh, less well-adjusted than people that were straight. And so it was sort of that combination of, of, of that kind of research on the one hand, and, this, uh, and having our community really pull together, so begin to pull together and feel a little safer to be out, that finally uh, turned around in 1973 when the American Psychiatric Association finally said, homosexuality in and of itself is not a mental disorder. And I must tell you the funniest thing for me. I went to bed sick, <laughs> I woke up healthy, it was the best cure I've ever had. So 73 was a good year for good all year of us. Good year for all of us. Now that doesn't happen overnight. I mean, I, I wanted to ask you before, before I get to sort of the change agent mm. part of it, um, everybody knows about the Kinsey Report. No, hardly anyone knows what it was exactly. They think it was a study that showed that 10% of all people are probably gay, but, which isn't exactly what it showed. No. But it was also, um, it had a, another interesting effect, which was, I think a lot of people said, gosh, I didn't know it was that many people. And does, does that affect the way um, the profession would look on health as well? Yes, the Kinsey was, a, a tr I think, one of the moments, one of the beginning of the watershed moments that, you know, he conducted that research in the late f 40s and was published in the early 50s. And what was so surprising to people was that so many people reported that sometime in their life they had had a homosexual encounter. I mean, the number, I mean, there's only 10, around 10% that said they pretty much exclusively. Um, had those experiences, but almost 50% of men and women said, yeah, sometime in my life I felt had a fantasy or I had this experience and so on. And it really turned around the notion that homosexuality was unusual, just a few people over there. It was much more widespread, and that had a very important impact on people starting well, there, to think about it. It's this connection between normalcy, um, sort of numerical example, and health in a way. Yeah. I mean, to some extent, although I'm sure in your mm -hmm. profession you don't define healthy by what most people do, still this notion of normalcy really much more goes to what most people are like. Mm -hmm. That's sort of the oppression of it, but also isn't it part of the, the definition? So it makes us look more healthy as more of us come out, or at least more normal, mm -hmm. because there's just so many in a way. Is that, that's what I thought mm -hmm. Kinsey helped Absolutely. kind of to move it along. But there's a difference that's not about health, really, mm -hmm. um, just about prevalence. But it was a step. There were, there were several studies, and his being the first, his really said, hey, it's not unusual. Then there were several other studies that really look at cross-cultural and said, hey, it's not unnatural. We find it in many cultures, in many different animal species. And then we had people, beginning with Evelyn Hooker, in, in, in the mental health field, said, hey, it's not no, it's, not a, it's, it's normal. You can find, so, the, so there was a progression. But Kinsey was critical in opening up that notion about it being more widespread, and that was, that was very important. Well, the cross-cultural aspect is interesting, too. I know, Terry, you've worked with a number of uh, different cultures, and I know your work at, the, at a center in Asian Pacific, um, with Asian Pacific right. population. Mm -hmm. um, is, it, is our experience as a community the same, different, um, and also how, it, you know, the experience of people in their own communities about whether they feel uh, healthy and how the mental health profession deals with them? Well, uh, 
In, in a way, it is, uh, there's a parallel. I, I was interested in your comments earlier about how, um, the, about the changes um, and how powerful uh, sometimes mental health professionals and what they say uh, could, uh, could be used. Um, in, in many of the people of color communities, um, it is still considered abnormal to be gay or lesbian. And, and the argument is very much the same thing that we have been talking about. It is abnormal. The doctors say they are abnormal. And, uh, it, and because this has, very, uh, this has not been discussed a lot, uh, it is very easy for many of the ethnic presses to pull, uh, to, to continue and to perpetuate that kind of a notion. And in our multicultural society these, these days, um, the, the boundaries sometimes are still very, uh, are still very, very thick. Um, many people, because of language, because of cultures, they, they subscribe to very different um, cable channels. Um, and therefore, what we say today may not even get over the, to, to those airwaves. And the, the notion continue to be, uh, to, to be per perpetuated in, in, in that kind of ways that, that being gay or lesbian is abnormal. And it is a powerful tool. So when you work with, do you work with families um, in terms of uh, what the experiences of gay or lesbian, say Asian, Asian Pacific or Asian American mm -hmm. um, uh, clients? Mm -hmm. Do you work with their families as well or do you help their families sort of see um, mm -hmm. how their experience isn't so incredibly abnormal? Uh, it depends. It depends on, um, sometimes I work only with the gay and lesbian clients, other times working with their families. A lot of times, I, uh, it, it's very hard to work with both. Uh, one side would usually say, you know, you're on the other side. <laughs> and, and, uh, but uh, what I see as some of the changes with the, with the younger generation is, um, to give you an example, is that I was at a uh, parents and friends uh, conference not too long ago. And um, we were, uh, there were a few Asian parents there with their children. And uh, the kids were very well adjusted in many ways. They just c came out to their parents about, oh, just maybe two months ago. And um, since I could speak the language of the parents, I was talking to the parents. And, and, and it, I think it was a great progress for these parents to, to come to this, uh, to this function. Uh, but for the kids, it's sort of like, how come they're moving so slowly? Tell them that I'm okay, and, and I've told them so. Huh. And uh, so I, I could see the changes um, uh, that is going on also. Now, do you also see changes in the youth themselves? I mean, I've been to several conferences of you know, young people, mm -hmm. and it seems like they're much more, I'll use the word easily, you may disagree, I guess this is what the question is, incorporating sexual orientation as an aspect of diversity where you know a previous youthful generation was very hip about doing you know racial inter interracial work and, and considering mm -hmm. that that was diversity do you see that among young people well especially well the college bounced uh, group definitely much much more so uh, in terms of uh, e even with the, uh, with many of the ethnic ethnic uh, di diverse uh, st students uh, in in Los Angeles, for example, uh, it is very hard not to get some of those notions and get sort of influenced by some of the the, the researchers that, that we know uh, by the campus environment uh, that may be very different than what their parents get oh, yeah. uh, through the ethnic cable channels. Well, you probably see that too, Jim. I mean, being at UCLA, um, it's a, a much more diverse student body than when I was there. I mean, coming to your class to even to uh, you know guest teach yes. to look around and go wow it's really really different than when I was here and the fact that there is a gay and lesbian student organization of course it's an old organization now and I guess 10% mm -hmm. the newspaper has been going for must be 20 years now or I don't know mm -hmm. what it's sort of amazing but um, I wanted to ask you the same thing do you see a difference first of all in the students and their attitude about sexual orientation? I think so. I, I think um, it's, it's good news and bad news. I, you know, I, I think um, students are certainly seeming more open to including sexual orientation as something that they value, uh, variation in sexual orientation is something they value. Um, but incoming freshmen throughout the country are polled every year. 
and still a, a sizable percentage of all incoming freshmen are fairly homophobic in their attitudes. Um, it's was running about 25-30% uh, endorsement of, of fairly homophobic statements, I think, in Anglo populations, and then in uh, students of color, it, it went up. So it, it, mm -hmm. there certainly is that, that cultural factor uh, going well, on. Well, it must be interesting working at the Student Counseling Center because, I mean, you're uh, a psychologist, you're a counselor. Um, I, I'm <coughs> assuming you're not even alone there as a, an out gay man mm -hmm. must have been what what is the staff like and the training at the center? well it's 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 an interesting kind of microcosm of the changes i came to student psychological services at ucla uh, as my first job right out of my internship um, and i had similar experiences that you had uh, mm -hmm. my training director not my training director but a director at my internship uh, talking about how you know, queers weren't sick anymore, but he was sick because he was a smoker, you know, and, and being very angry about that. <laughs> uh, when I when I came to UCLA, I just, you know, I, I did not present myself as a gay man, but that came out uh, fairly shortly thereafter. Over the years, it's it's, it's really changed a lot. Um, it, it certainly didn't feel like there was a lot of pathologizing of gay and lesbian bisexual students back then, although there certainly was some. Um, it kind of moved toward uh, kind of a careful tolerance, uh, I think, in, in, in their interactions with me, kind of checking out who is this guy, you know, and, and is he going to be strident or, you know, what's his story? Um, but over the years, we've had more uh, gay and lesbian, bisexual staff hired, um, and it, it, the, the whole issue of sexual orientation has become one not of um, something to tolerate, but something to actively embrace and bring in. Um, increasingly, when we select our interns, we want a diverse group of interns. We want you know, students of color, we want men and, and women, we want um, sexual orientation variations among our intern group. Um, I, I write a lot of letters of recommendation for past interns, and a lot of universities in the counseling centers are now actively soliciting people with gay, lesbian, bisexual experience, which is a way of saying they want someone queer, you know, coming in. Mm -hmm. um, so <laughs> it, it's gratifying to write those. It's yeah. gratifying to write those letters. I'm, I'm seeing lots of re you know requests for those kind of letters. Well, it's it is certainly being considered as an aspect of diversity, mm -hmm. and and I know there. Are, you know, sensitivity training or, or, you know, it's considered multicultural work, but what do you think, Linda, why, why this change? So we have a new set of research, and the research says they're not ill, but it's got to be more than that. Well, I think the other reason that, that I think is that it really coincided with a social movement, which is the homophile rights movement. It started after World War II, got my, many more people going to cities, got gay and lesbian people talking to each other, and over those years, you know, organizations like I mentioned before, you know, Managing Doors of Politis and so on. And I think what began to happen is people began to feel a group identity as a minority. In other words, it's really switched from seeing us as something that was individually deviant. That's what we were being told. That's what psychology was telling us. But then people started to talk to each other, even if they're in private, even if still guarding the door because they're still afraid. I know people, you know, when it comes through and take them away. But they started talking to each other. And, and my sense, and be interest other people as well, is that what that did was gave us a sense of coming together as a community. Gave us a, gave us a, and gave us an also, at the same time, I guess the other key factor I'm not mentioning, which is an obvious one, is McCarthyism and a period of time in the 50s in which we were also being labeled as dangerous and actually gave us minority status by virtue of being discriminated against. And I think that helped us organize in ways in the 50s and 60s so that by 69 we have Stonewall. And there's no accident in my mind that in the early 70s, Psychology was wo and psychiatry was one of the groups we targeted because they were mislabeling us, they were ruining our lives, they were getting people to kill themselves, and we weren't going to take it anymore. And so I think that I really do believe that it was, you know, the spirit of get used to it. I think it was that combination of that political activism that got stimulated among mental health professionals who were gay and closeted, who also came together and said, and really put pressure. And also, I guess the one other thing, I think there were straight allies, an important allies within the mental health field who really knew us and knew this didn't fit. And I, I mean, that's my sense. I don't mm -hmm. know if other people might. Well, let's, you might, let's you might. put a comma in there Sorry. and take a very brief break. Don't go away. We've got a lot more. Hi, I'm Greg Luganis, and I want to tell you about an organization called Paws LA. That's Pets are Wonderful Support. They help people living with AIDS or HIV keep and care for their pets. Paws LA needs your help. 
If you'd like to ensure someone else's quality of life, please call 213-876-PAWS. Hi, welcome back to Get Used to It. I'm Sheila Kuehl, and today we're talking about mental health in our community. Uh, you thought you were crazy, you found out you weren't crazy, and now we're okay and you're okay, and the right wing is really the one who's crazy. So that's kind of what the show is about. I'd like to welcome back our guests, Dr. <laughs> Linda Garnett, Dr. Terry Gock, Dr. Jim Babel. Lots of doctors here. I'm just a lawyer, nothing to worry about. So, <laughs> good. Uh, we were talking, actually, not about a, a funny issue, but right before the break, Linda, you were talking about how the mental health profession had, in essence, made us feel so sick, and many of us had decided we were uh, so hopeless that we would simply end our lives. And I think one of the things that we've heard a lot about in the past year or so is that uh, in terms of teen or youth suicide, that young gay and lesbian people have a much higher propensity for suicide than their straight counterparts. Is that true? And uh, if so, I guess that must be an aspect of what you're talking about. It is an aspect of what I'm talking about. I think, I think each of us probably know a little bit about this. Um, there's a couple of reasons. The good news is that kids are coming out at earlier ages and not taking as long. So there is more in this generation that you were talking about different cohorts a group at younger ages that are coming out. It's tough to be coming out as an adolescent. The pressures are really tough and the social pressures and the homophobia can be really high. And so there's been a number of studies that have been finding a high incidence of kids really struggling uh, with suicide. Mm -hmm. uh, so, well, and, and go ahead, Terry. Yeah, I was going to say it, uh, the, the, that has you know that has been documented quite a bit. Is is a lot of times is is that kind of a, additional pressure one has to go through uh, a young younger kid would have to go through these days coming out and and dealing with the peers. You know that uh, and from from. Day one, they hear about queers and, and being sissies and homos and dykes and so on. That had really, and then finally realizing that that means them. Mm -hmm. it, it, make, it makes it mm -hmm. very difficult. But uh, one thing I have to, to want to add on to is this is not uh, also, this is not something uh, new. I remember in the, uh, even in the early 80s, um, uh, we, we know that uh, there have been a number of studies that says that gay and lesbian have a high rate of suicide. Uh, and suicide attempts than other than their their straight counterparts. Now, um, some of the uh, some it has been uh, uh, it has been used in the old days to say that see they are sick you know they kill yeah. themselves more um, and so on. But when you really look at those data, it, it really uh, it's quite clear that um, and one of the studies by the Kinsey Institute uh, that looked into it. Really, what they are saying is that it's very hard to come out as being gay and, or, and lesbians, and when they break up in a relationship, nobody is there co compared to the um, uh, that the whole it, uh, the whole society is behind a, a straight uh, couple breaking up, mm -hmm. and that the lack of support there, there and and those kind of things are, are what made the the suicide uh, rate higher, not because we're sicker. Right. I mean, they tend. They would say they would drive you crazy. They would label you as crazy. You would kill yourself because they make no room for you in the world. And then they say, "You see, I told you." Exactly. Which is really, a, I think, a, the way women also had had experienced mm -hmm. the same mm -hmm. thing. I mean, mm -hmm. society drives you nuts. You you go nuts, mm -hmm. and they say, "See, I told you." They they couldn't stand it. Mm -hmm. Well, you work with young people all the time. What kind of issues? What kind of issues do they present? to you coming in to, to talk in the counseling center? Well, certainly we, we see our share of depression and, and suicidal crises. Um, and, uh, you know, I, I think, by the way, that the, the suicide statistics, you know, for gay and lesbian youth are underreported mm -hmm. because, you know, frequently the, the young person who's very tortured over sexual identity is not talking about sexual identity. So when they kill themselves and everybody wonders mm -hmm. why, or when they drive their car in, in such a way as to have an accident um, in order to kill themselves, no one really knows why. But I, I think a l very frequently there is a sexual orientation conflict underneath that. Um, it, it, at, the, at the counseling center, we, we see a lot of students coming in um, dealing with early stage coming out issues, kind of a developmental crisis around, around um, coming out. Coming out to themselves. Coming out to themselves you. and then to a very hostile environment, uh, family, peers, that kind of thing. Um, beyond that, I, I think a couple of the, the biggest things I see, and maybe the two of you in your, in your practice as well, uh, self-esteem issues, very low self-esteem and difficulties with relationship. Mm -hmm. 
You know, it's hard to come through a family that rejects you, an oppressive environment, and, and not feel um, not as good about yourself. Mm -hmm. uh, you know, the way I also frame it, just because uh, we were talking about the illness model, is, you know, in terms of this discussion, what really has been the shift is in the old days, we would, as everyone's saying, we'd say it's because of the gay person. You know, something inherent in the person. And the, one of the major shifts is realizing how much we are as well adjusted as heterosexuals, but the reason we have adjustment problems, by and large, is what people are saying, is having to deal with minority stress and status, having to deal with all these social oppression that says we're not okay. And I think the one other thing to point out, and I really agree that the suicide is serious and there are problems, but I also, being an optimist and knowing truthfully there is a positive side, our community, and I have been so impressed as a clinician and working in the community organizationally, very resilient. I mean, it's amazing that we're as well adjusted as heterosexuals given all this additional pressure. I always <laughs> yeah. feel this with other minorities, you know. I don't, and also that the, one of the gifts that I think that psychologists who have really fought hard, all, you know, us among and the four, all four mothers and forefathers fought so hard to change the misperception that we were sick, has allowed people the freedom to be out. You know, I just know the difference of the generations of people who've had to hide their entire life, you know, and maybe came out 10 years ago. I met someone who about to their 70, you know, because finally they could. And the freedom, at least, with people who are younger, who are able to come out sooner, have support from other people. I mean, I think that other dimension, you know, is really, just I don't want to lose that part, particularly in urban communities. Mm -hmm. I think it's much tougher in suburban and rural areas where you get more of this really being isolated. But I think there's so many ways that are being out invisible and psychology saying it's okay, you know, it's a natural part of who you are has been also a powerful different message. And well, there's I, a couple you know, of threads too. I mean, I, as, you know, as a politician, but also as a community organizer, it seems to me that that's what community organizing is about. It's not only about making an, an institution do what you want them to do, which is part of it, but also about just making sure that people get together. You know, when you say, I'm not mm -hmm. alone, you know, I'm not isolated, I, I actually seem to be okay. Perhaps there's something wrong with the way they're talking about us. And then, of mm -hmm. course, activism takes the next step, which is to say, you have to do something about this. I mean, isn't in the, in the American Psychological Association, aren't you activists within that association? I mean, wouldn't you define well, it that I would, way? We like to believe so. <laughs> uh, we we, like we define believe. ourselves yeah. that yeah, way. Yeah, I exactly. Don't know. Yeah. I don't think there's any question. Mm -hmm. you because know? you changed that organization. Isn't that the case? That is the well that we've been part of a, gr yeah. a movement of people. I, I we have to recognize that those people that are before us that have laid a lot of the groundwork. Yeah. But there's no question. Yeah. You know, having a resolution that says, you know, we have to remove the stigma of mental illness that has affected gay people. We have, you know, resolution after resolution from the American Psychological Association that says we're okay really makes a difference. So but but that work is finished. I mean, there there are still psychologists and other mental health professionals who are treating homosexuality. In fact, I, I, we were talking over lunch, I just saw in the uh, California Psychologist today an ad for a conference in Beverly Hills in May, um, headed, by Nicolosi, headed by Nicolosi and some other people, all about uh, reparative therapy for gay and lesbian people. These are the people that, that um, have been doing all the damage for years and years. They're still out there, and they're still you know, kind of banging on the door trying to get into and influence uh, APA and American Psychiatric Association, things like that. Yeah. The, the difference, though, is that now they are the minority. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. They are, they the are not They're the fringe. fringe. They are the fringe yeah. now. Yeah. When you say, explain more about reparative therapy. It sounds awful. Well, the, the old reparative therapy was, you know, you could, you could give them electric shock or emetics, things that would make them vomit on, on, you know, on pictures of, of same-sex you know, attraction. Uh, that was more old-fashioned kind of approaches. Um, um, nowadays, it's uh, looking at the, um, it, and this happened in the mm -hmm. past too, but now the big thrust is looking at the faulty uh, identification with parent. So um, I think Nicolosi talks a lot about essentially uh, re-establishing a strong sense of masculinity in these pathetic gay men, um, getting them to bond with other men in a non-sexual kind of way, and they will then be repaired and go on to lead. So they could happy, join the healthy, NRA or lives. something yeah. really yeah. 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 productive. Interestingly, too, is that in, in many of these psychological studies uh, that uh, these people talk about and, and, and the, the tr treatment approaches, lesbians are seldom talk, uh, mm -hmm. talk about. In, in these negative approaches, mm -hmm. is that what you're in saying? These reparative therapies. Yeah, yeah. reparative therapies is usually. Yeah, the model. Gay men. The, I, mean, I wouldn't talk about it earlier, but the model has always been studying a few gay men and generalizing it. A few white 
middle class gay men and generalizing to everybody. And that's I think it's the white middle, middle class, class gay men who are really tormented. Mm -hmm. Right, then. right. <laughs> uh huh. You mean tormented by others? By, by, Inter by no. internally by their mm -hmm. own sexual identities and generalizing it to everybody, women, men. Well, also okay. if if they are tormented, of course, they're the only ones to be important anyway, because women and people of color always had their torments, but we didn't identify them as, mm -hmm. you know, being a really serious issue. But also there's something, well, there's always been something um, sort of strange in the heterosexual community about lesbians. Mm -hmm. uh, in the way we were thought of, we were either invisible or erotic. I mean, that mm -hmm. was, whatever's erotic, of course, is defined by men generally out in society, mm -hmm. or it was anyway. And we so, were erotic foreplay. Yeah, <laughs> right. I mean, it was le that was fine. Mm -hmm. Lesbians could do that because that was interesting and exciting and kind of kinky. Mm -hmm. But oh my God, you know, gay men. That we we certainly couldn't deal with that. Mm -hmm. What other issues um, do people present from our community in terms of their own concerns about um, their own mental health? Yeah. One one of the things I, I'm impressed with these uh, these days. Um, uh, are the diversity of issues of everyday living. Mm -hmm. Parenting. Who would have thought about it five, five, ten years ago? Gay and lesbian parents and dealing with issues of parenting. Um, you know, uh, relationships is not, is not, uh, it is sort of like that I have a right to be in a relationship, yeah. help me in this relationship rather than seeing how tormented I am. And these, uh, th those are two thoughts that I just come mm -hmm. to th think about. Well, it seems as though, um, though you started to talk, when you're talking about reparative therapy, I know that uh, we are in the, in the midst uh, at this moment of a, a political backlash about, against the community as a whole. And I would imagine, I mean, I brought a bill to bar discrimination against students on the basis of sexual orientation in mm -hmm. schools. Mm -hmm. And one of the people who came to testify against the bill was a psychologist who talked about how dangerous it was to have any kind of positive see mm -hmm. non-discrimination was seen from his point of view as being an affirmation of mm -hmm. you know the homosexual lifestyle and how that was a bad thing to affirm that lifestyle for these young people uh, essentially because they would be unhappy for the rest of their lives I mean that was his testimony as a as a psychologist and so one of my colleagues said um, uh, Carrie Mazzoni who represents uh, 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 Marin mm -hmm said, excuse me, can I ask you a question? Are you saying that calling a boy a faggot at school is like good for his mental health because it will kind of divert him back into a good path? And this guy said, well, kind of. Wow. <laughs> so talk about reparative therapy. Do you see uh, in younger people, younger mm. than uh, really college people, that in terms of the counseling that they get at school, if any, uh, that if this is positive or negative as you, as you see it? Or do you know? I don't know a whole lot about what's going on in the, in the grade school and high schools, um, except a little bit indirectly. I know, you know, Virginia Uribe's Project 10 was going out into the schools and, and providing positive role models. Mm -hmm. And the Gay and Lesbian Association at UCLA um, was trained to go in as mentors for them. So uh, a couple of UCLA students would go to some of the schools that were um, more embracing of, you know, or, or identified as Project 10 schools and they were getting some mentoring and role modeling that way. Mm -hmm. um, yeah, I think also, I mean, I know Terry and I were involved in a project with the uh, American Psychological Association along these lines, because what we did is really try to develop guidelines of positive ways, of appropriate ways to work with gay men and lesbians. And what is important in terms of the power of psychology is there really is a whole theory and now research and approach of working with our community that we call affirmative therapy as opposed to reparative therapy or an illness model. And it just has a whole different premise. And the one we've been really starting to talk about now. But it must be difficult to get it out into the world, isn't it? I mean, I, I don't know how the profession is organized. My impression is it's not. I mean, that everyone is sort of, uh, I, I know you need to be licensed and whatever, but it's tantamount to sort of the legal profession mm -hmm. as well. You hang up a shingle, you do whatever mm -hmm. you want. You think whatever you want, you talk to your clients mm -hmm. however you want. It must be very difficult to 
to kind of infiltrate, and that's not the right word. Yeah. that increasingly graduate programs and uh, APA, American Psychological Association, approved internship sites are mandated to, to be more culturally exactly. sensitive. Mm -hmm. So, you know, when, when we are training our interns before they go out into the world and get licensed, uh, we're, we're training them in, in being more sensitive and affirming. I mean, I, I lecture them on affirmative psychotherapy with their gay and lesbian bisexual clients, and other people are, are lecturing them um, and supervising them on their work with um, um, clients of cultures different than their own. Mm -hmm. So there, there, there is some way of getting it out there, and, and I think it is mandated by the, by the profession. Yeah. And, and the, the report that has been prepared in terms of those guidelines is, is a readily available document uh, that, that has mm -hmm. been used. In fact, mm -hmm. I think uh, there are some states that have, ad uh, that have adopted it as, right. the, as the uh, sort of the appropriate way of working with lesbian and gay clients. So when you say the state, do you mean the State Psychological Association? Yeah, like That's Arizona, correct. for example, yeah. has taken these guidelines that we developed uh -huh. mm -hmm. and made them part of the state association's uh, pro way to work with gay and lesbian people. Mm -hmm. So we have done a lot, there's been a lot of uh, attempts at the local, we have a lot of state association levels to get this material out. And I think a lot of people wanted to know it. A lot of people knew they didn't know, they didn't even know they knew gay people, mm -hmm. or they really didn't know how to operate. Mm -hmm. um, and I th really think many people have welcomed it. In other words, there is a minority group, there is a backlash, but I still agree. My, um, mm -hmm. my perspective is that mo much more people, many more people yeah. have wanted to get trained, have wanted to understand about our community. Mm -hmm. Um, and uh, and I, the other reason is that I don't think our community has stopped being activists itself. As I said, it wasn't just the homophile rights movement. We've had a continued efforts to make sure that uh, we're protected in these ways. I think it's an important. Yeah. Just to sort of support your point, last year at the American Psychological Association convention in New York, we did uh, we prepared a workshop. Uh, on those guidelines, on those, you know, the way of working with lesbian gay uh, clients in, in, in an affirming way. And uh, we really expected something like 20, 30 people. You know, it, it, you, you have to appreciate that at, at w any one time, uh, one time slot during the convention, there may be 50 other things going on. And we suddenly had in this room packed with over 150 people. <laughs> Uh, that we weren't ready for, uh -huh. and it's, uh, we had to change the format totally. I mean, the, 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 the thirst for wanting to know, wanting to understand is there. So I, I, I always define the profession for myself as a, as a helping profession, but mm -hmm. you, you know, it, it's always difficult to know how professionals' own personal attitudes sort of cut against this, and I know this is, this is work that you've done. Uh, let me ask you a slightly loaded question. Is there a difference between the approach of the uh, psychiatrist and the psychologist to our community as you've experienced it or as you know it? Go for it, Terry. <laughs> <laughs> uh, in a glibber way, I would say the good psychiatrist and good psychologist approach it the same way. Uh, uh, but that's essentially it. I, I, I think um, uh, our, co our colleagues in the psychiatric profession um, that, that uh, that our understanding of the research and, and, and focus would be the same. We do different, sometimes we do different things. I mean, we, uh, um, psychologists in, in many ways, uh, as a general rule, uh, are trained, have more time in training in therapy and assessment, and psychiatrists uh, are trained much more in, in psychotropic medications. But uh, the general approach, um, the, the good ones, um, approach it very similarly. And has the American Psychiatric Association also uh, prepared and presented guidelines or that you're aware of? Well, they, it, it's, it's interesting. In most of the uh, professions, psychiatry, social work, psychology, there's been the same pattern. More, mm -hmm. more people have, first they passed resolutions saying that we weren't sick, then they began to develop some kind of guidelines, um, at least to ensure non-heterosexist practice. So I think there really have been parallels and there's caucuses within each of the professions to make sure that is actually implemented. We're going to take a short break. We're going to take a short break. I, I, yes, I did say that twice. Don't go away. There's more to come. Billy wants to work on airplanes someday, maybe one that you fly in. Now, would you like to call for this free booklet of simple ways to improve his education? Hi, I'm Sheila Kuehl. Welcome back to Get Used To It. Uh, as I hope you already know, today we're talking about mental health in our community. 
Uh, we've been talking about our community as a kind of monolith in a way. Uh, we have the gay lesbian community or you know the homosexual community and everybody else but within our community as we talked a little bit um, there's there's quite an aspect of diversity and and I would imagine that that also has an affect on the way the profession works with the community I know Terry you as we talked about you've done mm. work with communities of color is there a difference in terms of how the profession views them or kind of what the issues are um, not so much how the profession views them but the, there is, uh, in, in general, uh, um, an extra step, so, so to speak, in trying to integrate the identities of someone who's from people of color and also lesbian and gay, have to have go through that extra step of trying to integrate everything together in order to feel okay about themselves. And um, it's a different process than identifying oneself as gay or lesbian or as uh, a person of color. Uh, this, one of the things that is most, uh, most difficult is sort of like um, in this process is, is trying to find that niche of mm -hmm. where, uh, where one, one, one would be. Um, uh, there's a lot of pressure sometimes uh, pu pushing and pulling. Um, are you forsaking our community when you are lesbian or gay um, uh, and vice versa? Mm -hmm. and st uh, uh, th those are th things that they're not just from the outside. E emotionally, internally, I have experienced it. Uh, many people have gone through the same process of coming to terms of who we are as a total person. And uh, th there are those wonderful times too, especially nowadays, it's much more, uh, uh, it comes much easier. Those wonderful times when they all sort of pull together, even from the external, um, like with the, the, one of the hot topics these days with gay and lesbian marriages. The, one of the uh, organizations, one of the earliest organizations that supported this is the Japanese American Citizens League that okay. passed the res resolution. That's, right. That's one of those times where it pulled together for many of, of lesbians and gays who are Asian, Asian Pacific Islanders. Well, I know, just, I'm sorry. I was just to piggyback on that, when I've done uh, coming out groups for gay men at UCLA, frequently 75 or more percent of them are men of color. So clearly they're having much mm -hmm. more difficulty coming out. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Um, but I think, I think one way that, that the, the, the profession is, is dealing with that is really u utilizing community-based organizations as resources and, and continually pushing, go out there and get that support, you know, go to this group or that group um, and get more support. So we're certainly using Well, I know Phil community. Wilson, who, you know, is one mm -hmm. of the founders mm -hmm. of uh, the Black Gay and Lesbian Leadership Conference, mm -hmm. yeah. um, said on this show that one of the difficulties for him was he, you grow up black, you know you're in a minority status, but you're in your family. Mm -hmm. The family has that experience. They understand your experience. You go out in the world, you have that bad experience, you come back, you're in family. Mm -hmm. They've had it mm -hmm. too, they get mm -hmm. it. Now all of a sudden, you're gay. No one in your family is gay, so far as you know. They don't understand that experience. They don't like it. You don't have a home to go back to that's a safe place from the world. And you know, for many of us, that's a true statement in terms of our families, because for so many of us, our families you know, are heterosexual, most of us, so we have that dilemma. Additionally, for, for lesbians and gay men of color, it's not just the family, but it's the whole, it's the ethnic community. It's that foundation against discrimination that you know, I'm sure Phil felt from the beginning. So that pull between an ethnic foundation on the one hand and yet being true to one's sexual and um, emotional intimacy on the other creates enormous tensions. And that's where some of the organizations like the, uh, the, 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 that forum uh -huh. or many of the uh, people of color, lesbian, gay organizations uh, serve that vital uh, role mm -hmm. where pe people can feel at home, really. Well, and also the movement, not only being in terms of the racism of the movement, but mm -hmm. the sexism of it. I mean, we yes. know we in the do. early days uh, at the Gay Community Services Center, uh, the day that the little band of lesbians went and painted a, a lavender, you know, carrot and lesbian on yeah. the sign, you know, it was <laughs> kind of, it was like a hit on the center uh, and weren't really welcome there. And I think women and men have very different experiences within our community and probably that creates different issues as well or concerns. You could imagine I'd want to speak to that. Yes, please. Because <laughs> it's really true. I mean, it's such a, you know, I always tease when I uh, teach, my, I teach a psych, you know, psychology and lesbian experience class and I always tease the first day, you know. Um, the one thing gay men and lesbians have in common is, is social oppression because of being gay. 
past that, forget it. it <laughs> <laughs> and you know, it's actually, in my class, well, you know, when the class starts, the gay men and lesbians always are, are traditionally aligned. But as the class goes on and people hear the materials, you see the lesbians and the heterosexual women kind of organizing and <laughs> heterosexual. Because really, that, the thing we haven't talked about so much is that, uh, you know, it's the status of women versus men and being socialized as men and women, at least we've found in psychology, has enormous impact on lesbians and gay men and bisexuals as well as it does in the straight community. A sexual socialization is a much more powerful shaper than, than sexual orientation. You know, we, we really are men first, women first, and gay and lesbian second. And I think the other thing that's unique in the, uh, about the gay and lesbian community is um, gay men who are socialized to be men then go out and hang out sometimes exclusively with other men. So it's, it's all about being male and masculine and all of that socialization is, is kind of untempered by any mm -hmm. women. And the same with the women's community. Mm -hmm. they, they, there can be some isolation. So you really see kind of the, the pure forms, whereas heterosexuals who get married kind of have to you know, cooperate and <laughs> compromise you know, and, and work out some of those communication differences and, and those different stylistic differences. I think we can kind of heighten ours. And I think that's one of the problems uh, that gay men have in, in forming a relationship. They're, they're, they just haven't picked up those skills because there, there is no relationship building skill in the, the male trait community. Hmm. And, what, and, and women, on the other hand, care too much. Well, <laughs> if, if we are have anyway, no we care too much. But no. th I mean, that's the, that certainly can happen. Mm -hmm. I mean, I think you find, actually, one of the things that w we didn't get to talk about so much yet is, you know, there's been for so long, We've been talking about how we've been stigmatized and been sick and then maybe we're different from the norm but we're still kind of strange but when you really start to look at our relationships you know gay men and lesbians where we don't have the same rules where one's the husband and one's the wife although that's the myth we end up kind of creating some very interesting innovations because we're finding in psychology that uh, gay men and lesbians tend to create relationships more based on a model like best friends which is a little more egalitarian. We're not so specialized in, you know, you take out the garbage and, you know, you do the dishes <laughs> and, you know, there's other kind of criteria. So at least among, in, in, within, among lesbians, there's been some interesting findings that we create more egalitarian relationships. Or we strive for that. I think there's a move toward androgyny. And a move towards, yeah. yes. An incorporation of both the male and the female within each person. And well, it's an interesting question because for the future, I mean, one of the things I always wonder mm -hmm. is, you know, we've always been teachers, we've always been sort of the witches and the shamans and uh, poets and even the, when nobody was coming out, we always knew that those, you know, those were special spirits or whatever. Mm -hmm. And th I have a feeling that we, we have, the next step is kind of like we actually have something we can teach. Mm -hmm. I mean, this is an aspect of it. Mm -hmm. It's not like we're more healthy, obviously. Mm -hmm. We don't want to set up mm -hmm. a different dichotomy. Mm -hmm. But that there are aspects of our development out of oppression or out of our own, mm -hmm. you know, ethos, whatever it is. Mm -hmm. uh, and especially in these days when men and women in the activist communities are working so much mm -hmm. together, have seen the connection, you know, men who were apolitical, uh, having to deal with lesbians who were organizing every political movement since the 1920s, mm -hmm. you know, and looking at each other across this vast chasm, now discrimination because of AIDS has brought them into activism. Women who were essentially not very funny and didn't have a very good time and hadn't discovered the mm -hmm. gay gene for fun, you know, <laughs> getting to know more gay men and really, I think, lightening up enormously yes. so that we really are a community, mm -hmm. though I think that's not happening you know, just people living their regular lives, as you've yeah. said. Um, but I think it must be the case that we do have something, really, to bring to this and to teach in terms of our own health, which we have yet to discover, maybe. Mm -hmm. And I think, mm -hmm. you know, some of the psychological studies nowadays are looking at those kind of things, mm -hmm. coming out from a very different uh, focus or, or approach and paradigm than in the past where, you know, it's when, when you're considered sick, everything is, uh, that comes out of that kind of approach is, you know, what kind of sickness and how is it manifested. Mm -hmm. and now we're talking about the, the diversity in, in, in relationships uh, um, and, and the strengths in the relationship mm -hmm. and the strengths that we, we, can, we can provide. Um, uh, and, and all that is, is, is very positive. I, I mean, it cannot but make society as a whole perhaps a better one. But we still stigmatize some of the diversity in our community. 
I mean, I know gay and lesbian people are still wary of bisexual people. Yeah, I was just going to speak to that. Yes, please. Mm -hmm. I was just going to say, if we're going to talk about diversity, you know, the other aspect that we haven't touched on so much are people are bisexual. And for so long, in, you know, both psychology and our community said, these people, they're not real. You know, they, we said, you know, we're just, you know, just give yourself long enough and you'll be one of you'll us. You'll find out you're gay. <laughs> right. You know, yeah. And the heterosexual said, stay away from us because you have a drop of homosexuality in you, so we don't want you. And psychology said, you're nothing. You're just a transitionary thing. You don't exist. And I think that, you know, I was thinking of putting the lavender L in. Well, now we're putting the, you know, the rainbow B in because, you know, now what's happening is people are really recognizing that there, are, there really are groups of people who don't use um, biological sex as, you know, as the determinant of who they're drawn to. There's other factors. That kind of complexity and fluidity of hum human sexuality hopefully would, would, would help in even diluting this whole abnormal stuff that, mm -hmm. that you know, that started the show. Even in terms of show. heterosexual people exactly. and what's defined yes. as, as, uh, as abnormal, because yeah. it's been very limited. What about our transgendered community? I mean, now there's, uh, it, it's an interesting thing because every time you move along a spectrum of, mm -hmm. now we say to straight people, no, 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 we're fine. We're really healthy. You have to just get to know us. We're lovely people. And then we say, but we're not so sure about the bisexuals. And the bisexuals say, oh, no, no, we're fine. We're lovely people. You just have to get to know us. And then everyone looks at the transgender community, kind of scratches their head and say, I don't, I'm not sure I still understand that. I, I think one, one issue here is, is that we as a, as a community, are unsure of our identity. I mean, what makes up our, our community? Mm -hmm. um, the sexual orientation is, is a fluid process, as mm -hmm. you were saying. Um, and and these, these categories are very difficult to define and, and which, which groups are in and which groups are out. Um, mm -hmm. I, I think some people, though, are, are seeing our community as one more of a, of a political movement and a, and a human rights movement. And in that sense, I think there's a, a tendency to want to include transsexuals because it's, it's a movement of inclusion and acceptance mm -hmm. and, and embracing mm -hmm. difference. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Yeah, I, I think the other the other thing that I could think of uh, is that um, you said it. You know, it's, uh, we we don't know, and uh, that has been one of the things that that sort of separate people is that we don't know who they are, and that has also been the the way that the other the other side has been mm -hmm. able to capitalize on that fear of pushing putting everything everyone that is different together uh, for political uh, gains in a way? Well, let's talk about that because what I've heard really re very recently, and of course in my work I, I hear it a lot, um, is a kind of backlash against these gains. And yes. of course psychology is not the only profession where we see it. We want to roll back the laws. We want to roll back everything. Uh, civil rights particularly, mm -hmm. but you must, I guess, see the same thing in your own profession where s there are other people trying to gain ascendance again in re as it were, uh, mm -hmm. the community. I, I think that's what you were just talking about before, but I'd like to hear more about it. Yeah, I think w there's no question that's what's happening, that um, uh, at, I, I was sharing uh, at lunch something relevant to this, I, I, by mistake. Christian Coalition material landed in my mailbox. And in reading through it, in what, what was the political agenda, one message read as follows, recognize homosexuality is abnormal. Now that was going to, you know, this was going to my neighbor. Um, and so th that the political climate is feeling that it's important to relabel us as sick as a vehicle um, to, pr to promote their agenda. They have been able successfully, unfortunately, to find a set of psychologists, psychiatrists, um, uh, social workers who have o either always felt we were sick and always thought this was just advocacy nonsense um, or be getting other political gain from um, bringing back a, a really outmoded uh, information. The good news, which always is appealing to me, um, is that we now, unlike the 30s and the 40s and maybe the early 50s, have an enormous set of information and organ organizations in our community and among our allies, which absolutely refutes us. We have data on our side. We have, I mean, w you got a bit watching us. We seem pretty okay. <laughs> you know, you got the reality of people's lives. Be what I mean by that is more of us are out and people can't say anymore, we only, I don't know any gay people, you know, so if we're only symbols of what they represent, of course they're gonna believe the propaganda. But if they meet us, 
um, it's really hard for them not to like us because, you know, we're not, we're just much more vanilla than they thought, you know. So I think the strategies of us being out, the strategies of our information, and I think that's what's happening in psychology is making this a, a very different confrontation. You know, to, maybe, you know, Terry could talk, but even last weekend we, we watched this fight at the American Psychological Association, mm -hmm. kind of watching mm -hmm. this come up again. Yeah. Yeah, the, the, the tenants now are very, are very, very different. Uh, for, for f perhaps very different from the past is that it's now uh, we are, you know, we are not, ha we don't have to prove it. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Is, that, um, is that somehow reparative therapy, the abnormalcy has to prove it, uh, which has been very, it's very different. And I see how much that is not the mainstream of the profession anymore. Um, and that's the, that's the positive part. Mm -hmm. But it is a powerful force, especially when the, there are few, even if it is a fringe and it is a small, small movement, combined with a larger uh, social political context, mm -hmm. um, it, it could be used. Uh, my, my concern is, you know, the, the younger people, as well as people, you know, anyone who is just coming out and being traumatized by, by these kind of, of propaganda again. Well, it seems as though our, part of our, our great weaponry are uh, people like the three of you. And I want to encourage everyone, uh, if you are seeking any kind of mental health help and you feel as though you're not being treated positively, go somewhere else. Because the profession clearly has made great strides in this. Uh, I also want to mention again Dr. Garnett's, the book that you wrote, if you have a copy of it to show to our audience, because I know yeah, often they sure. call in and say, you mentioned that book at the beginning of the show, I don't know what it is, Psychological Perspectives on Lesbian and Gay Male Experiences, Linda Garnett's, and I know it's available because I've seen it in the bookstores, and I'm very, very happy you were all here. Thank you very much for being here. Remember, we're okay, you're okay, get used to it.